In 2012, the use of opioids reached its peak in the United States, with 255 million prescriptions written that year, or 81 for every 100 Americans. The problem persists. In 2020, 70,000 Americans died from opioid abuse, and many more were affected. In short, the reason for the decades-long climb in opioid abuse is the proliferation of easy-to-access opioid painkillers that were claimed by the manufacturers to not be addictive, despite the fact they very much are, and be perfectly suited not just for chronic pain sufferers, but almost anyone with a bit of a twinge. Much of the blame for the widespread abuse of opioids is often attributed to the Sackler family, owners of Purdue Pharma, who made billions of dollars from the widely prescribed opioid OxyContin, which despite being dangerously addictive was easy to get a hold of because the Sacklers bought off doctors and aggressively marketed the drug almost as a cure-all. Some patients may be afraid of taking opioids because they're perceived as too strong or addictive, but that is far from actual fact. Less than 1% of patients taking opioids actually become addicted. But even though the Sackler's name often comes up in news reports, it seems almost as faceless as Purdue or Pfizer themselves. Every gang needs a frontman, doesn't it? But none of the Sacklers seem especially interesting, as you might expect with a family that appears to have happily laid waste to the general well-being of society for their own enrichment. That might be because the current generation of Sackler leadership achieved very little on their own, merely acting out the playbook of the man who started all of this, and who they apparently despise. You see, this has all happened before. Before Americans were addicted to opioids, they were addicted to Valium. In 1975, as many as two-thirds of the adult population had a prescription. It was a miracle drug that could reduce anxiety, help children sleep, and improve anyone's life. The makers swore up and down that it wasn't addictive, but it was. Arthur Sackler was the man behind not only Valium, but the idea of marketing pharmaceuticals directly to doctors. If you want to understand not only how the Sacklers got to where they are, but how the pharmaceutical industry as a whole got to where it is, you have to understand Arthur. And I should say, before we get our gloves wet, that a lot of the information about Arthur comes from Empire of Pain, which is a book that I imagine you can buy or borrow if you can be bothered. I'm modern, and when my little Rodney has a cold, he gets a pill. It's modern. Isaac Sackler and Sophie Greenberg were Jewish immigrants from Galicia and Poland, respectively, who both came separately to New York, where they later met, before the First World War. They settled in Brooklyn, where Isaac started a grocery store business with his brother, called Sackler Brothers. The business was successful, and Isaac later sold it and began to invest in real estate and rental properties. Soon, they were middle class and living the American dream. Isaac and Sophie had three sons, Arthur, Mortimer, and Raymond. Born August the 22nd, 1913, Arthur was the oldest of the three brothers. He was born as Abraham, but later changed his name to Arthur, although the reason for this isn't clear. He has been described by family as very entrepreneurial from an early age. Arthur went to a well-regarded public school, where among other things he began to develop an interest in advertising. He worked for the school newspaper as an editor, and began selling advertising space on school publications. After selling advertising to a post-secondary school called Drake Business Schools, he convinced the company where he was working to hire him, despite still being a high school student, 
as their advertising manager. There, he came up with ideas like putting the company branding on rulers and distributing them to other high school students for free. By the age of 15, he was making enough money from his various jobs that he could help support his family. And soon, he had so many jobs lined up that he couldn't keep up and began passing them off to his brothers, Mortimer and Raymond. The two younger brothers even did advertising work for Arthur. For example, getting the Chesterfield Cigarette Company to place advertisements in their own high school. And no unpleasant aftertaste. Around this time, however, Arthur's family began to have financial problems. Some of his father's real estate investments went bad, and they didn't have the grocery business anymore to fall back on. Isaac bought a coffee shop, but it failed, and he had to close it. He ended up working as a cashier in someone else's grocery store, trying to keep his family afloat. By 1929, the year of the Wall Street crash, Arthur's father was financially ruined. One day, he sat his sons down and told them that he didn't have any money to send them to college. The family had always greatly valued education, and according to Arthur, by the time that I was four, I knew that I was going to be a physician. My parents brainwashed me about being a doctor. In 1929, Arthur began his pre-med studies at New York University. He worked a variety of odd jobs whenever he could to pay his way through school, like waiting tables and working in a candy shop. He left his previous advertising job back home with his brothers, whom he coached on how to operate them. By the time he graduated from college in 1933, Arthur had saved enough money during an era of record unemployment to buy a new store for his parents before he began medical school at NYU. As a side note, his two brothers also went on to become doctors, but the road wasn't easy. Mortimer was rejected from NYU Medical School for being Jewish. By the mid-30s, up to 60% of medical school applicants were Jewish, leading to the implementation of quotas on how many Jewish students could attend. Mortimer had trouble finding a medical school anywhere in the US at that time that would accept Jews, and eventually Mortimer and his brother Raymond would both have to go to Scotland for their medical training, financed completely by Arthur. Eventually, all three brothers ended up working together at Creedmoor Psychiatric Centre in Queens for their medical residencies. Arthur, of course, went first and then recruited Raymond and Mortimer, and he became, as did they, fascinated by psychiatry. He came home for lunch as white as a sheet and said, Today I saw something terrible. And he described the first electric truck treatment. At that time, there were two competing theories about the origins of mental illness. Many doctors believed that mental illness was caused by genetics and couldn't be prevented. The only solution, therefore, was to institutionalize such people and immediately sterilize them. You know, just in case they get out and immediately start procreating. On the other side of the debate were the Freudians, who thought that early life experiences underpinned mental illness, and that the best treatment was talk therapy, possibly while sort of laying down on a sort of couch. Sort of like Frasier, whoever that is. Arthur was disturbed by what he witnessed in the psych wards, calling the institutionalization of the mentally ill the limbo of the living dead. He abhorred the liberal and seemingly cruel use of electroshock therapy and lobotomies as treatment for mental illness. At the time, lobotomies, which essentially make people into chilled out zombies, were being performed on people, especially women, for all sorts of problems like depression. Of course, lobotomizing someone doesn't really cure anything. Arthur began to obsess over the idea of addressing mental illness using pharmaceuticals, which really wasn't a thing then. The brother Sackler decided to do some experimentation. 
They noted that electroshock therapy sometimes provided relief for people, but nobody really knew why. They set up an experiment that involved electroshocking a rabbit. In short, they determined that electroshocks caused a release of histamine, which causes blood vessels to dilate and bring more oxygen to the brain. They wondered if they could just inject patients with histamine and skip the painful electroshocks. So, they began experimenting on the patients of Creedmoor, because back then, doctoring was apparently a viscera flinging free-for-all, and they found out that the treatment enabled about a third of schizophrenic patients to improve enough to be sent home. This was a big deal. The brothers published over 100 medical papers on the subject, but I think more importantly, it made Arthur sure that the path forward for medicine was in pharmaceuticals. After this, the Sackler brothers opened their own research centre at Creedmoor, devoted to researching pharmaceutical alternatives to electroshock therapy. Around this time, the Sackler's father, Isaac, had a heart attack and ended up in the hospital. Before he died, he told his sons that he was sorry that he couldn't leave them an inheritance, but that he had left them something more important. A good name. This was something he had always pressed on his sons. If you make and lose a fortune, you can always make and lose another one. If you lose your good name, you can never get it back. While Arthur worked full-time at Creedmoor, he also worked a part-time job as a copywriter for a medical advertising agency called William Douglas McAdams, where he apparently did some impressive work. Arthur had figured out that in selling medicine, you need to advertise to doctors more than consumers. If your doctor said to take a certain brand of medication, then most people would. He was so successful in his advertising campaigns that he was promoted to president only two years after he began working at the company. This marked the beginning of when Arthur would actually begin to get rich. Not in medicine, but in advertising. It was Arthur who pioneered advertising campaigns that appealed directly to doctors. He placed advertisements for medicine in medical journals, he distributed literature to doctors' offices, and he got prominent doctors to endorse his products. Arthur went on to buy the McAdams agency, and he continued to run certain accounts personally. One of the first really big accounts for him was Pfizer. Prior to World War II, Pfizer had been a chemical company, selling chemicals in bulk to pharmacists who would mix the formulations themselves. This was common at the time. All drugs were essentially generic, and pharmaceutical companies didn't make finished products, only their chemical components. When the US entered the Second World War, the government needed penicillin for its troops, and enlisted companies like Pfizer to manufacture it. By the time the war ended, Pfizer and other drug companies were fully manufacturing drugs like penicillin instead of just the chemicals needed to make them. However, the finished drugs weren't patented, and any company could make them, which meant they were cheap and not very profitable to manufacture. So, the pharmaceutical industry began scrambling to make new drugs that they could patent and sell. By the 1950s, new drugs were flooding the American market, and pharmaceutical companies turned to advertising as a way to try and reach consumers in the wake of so much competition. In Arthur's main strategy to advertise directly to doctors who prescribe the drugs, rather than the consumers who purchase them, he created advertisements for medicine that resemble consumer advertising, with eye-catching graphics and punchy catchphrases, and he put them in medical journals. He created his own newspaper for doctors called the Medical Tribune, where he placed ads for the companies who were clients at McAdams, without any kind of disclosure, of course. He created literature extolling the virtues of his clients' products and had them distributed to doctors' offices. The ads and literature would often reference scientific studies that were directly funded by the drug companies themselves. 
when Pfizer had a new antibiotic that it wanted to advertise, called Teramycin, it turned to the ad agency McAdams and its owner, Arthur Sackler. A Northwest Mountie, and he's been trailing this desperate character for three years, and I'm tired. When Arthur met with Pfizer about working on their new antibiotic, he promised that he would be able to make Pfizer a household name. And he did. He was especially keen on the idea that the branding of the entire company was more important than the branding of specific products, which was pretty much unheard of at the time. Most consumers didn't know one drug company from another. Some of the earliest ads Sackler did for Teramycin didn't mention the drug's name at all, just vague promises about the dawning of a new era in drug treatment, coming soon from Pfizer. Arthur later worked with Pfizer to hire detail men, sales representatives who would travel around to doctors' offices and talk to them about the new drug, sometimes taking them out for meals. He also helped to pioneer the idea of native advertising, ads that are disguised to look like editorial content in newspapers. In one case, he even took out a 16-page supplement in the New York Times. In the end, teramycin wasn't different from any other antibiotic, but thanks to Arthur's aggressive advertising to doctors, it was a huge success and made Pfizer incredibly wealthy. According to a former co-worker at the agency, Arthur invented the wheel when it came to modern medical advertising. Arthur also implemented a lot of the branding strategies he used back in high school. Under his direction, Eli Lilly distributed stethoscopes to medical students. Roche provided medical students with free textbooks about medical conditions that they produced drugs to treat. Pfizer began sponsoring golf tournaments, because what doctor doesn't like golf? where the balls were printed with the Pfizer name. The whole idea of courting doctors to prescribe specific drugs came from Arthur's work, as well as the shift towards branding of drug companies rather than just the drugs themselves. Another notable strategy Arthur used was to try and market drugs for as many different conditions as possible, a strategy that would be adopted by many drug companies going forward. In 1952, Arthur and his brothers decided to buy a small patent medicine company in Greenwich Village called Purdue Frederick, which made products like laxatives and earwax remover. The brothers split ownership of the company equally, but Arthur was a silent partner. In reality, Arthur financed the entire venture and basically wanted this drug company to belong to his brothers so that they would have a company of their own while he ran his advertising business alone. This is a common theme throughout the Empire of Pain book. Arthur financing different ventures, but being secretive about his involvement. The author of Empire of Pain observes that it often looks like Arthur used his brothers as the faces of businesses that he himself conceived and financed. In 1953, Raymond and Mortimer were fired from Creedmoor for refusing to sign a declaration of loyalty to the United States and to pledge to report on anyone involved in anything subversive. The country was in the middle of a Red Scare, and the FBI had been investigating the two brothers as suspected members of a communist cell at the hospital. It seemed like a good time for them to put some renewed focus on the little company that they had purchased, Purdue Frederick. Where does it all start? Sometimes here, with an acid stomach. The Sackler Empire's foundation was cast the day Arthur Sackler was born, but it was the 1950s when it was actually built. Arthur began collecting businesses to complement his ever-growing portfolio. His ad agency, McAdams, became one of the biggest firms in New York for advertising drugs. His research center at Creedmoor studied the effects of drugs. He started a radio station just for doctors that broadcast 24 hours a day, 
and was sponsored by other pharmaceutical companies. He opened another research laboratory in a college in Brooklyn. This is also around the time that Arthur began to develop, or at least display, a vindictive streak. Arthur hired many Jews at a time when nobody would hire them. If they were struggling to find a job, he would find Jewish doctors a place at his advertising company. He had black employees, employees who had been blacklisted in the McCarthy era as suspected communists. Arthur himself had been interested in communism when he was in medical school, as were his brothers. His brother Raymond at one point was even a card-carrying member of the Communist Party. But Arthur wasn't hiring any of them out of the goodness of his heart. When his Jewish employees would ask him for a raise, he would refuse and say, where else are you going to go? Referring to systemic anti-Semitism in the job market, a la the Jewish quota at hospitals. Former employees have said they weren't paid well, but they never left. During the 50s, Arthur's ad agency had only one competitor in New York, a company called L.W. Froelich. After the president of the company, Ludwig Wolfgang Froelich, as it turns out, Arthur and Froelich were close friends, and to circumvent competition rules, Arthur decided to help his friend Froelich set up a competing company, essentially using him as a proxy. Froelich was close to all three Sackler brothers, and it was around this time that, according to Richard Leather, a lawyer who worked with all four men, Froelich and the Sackler boys made a pact. They would pool all of their business holdings and assets, helping each other in their individual interests. When one of them died, the other three would inherit his business. When the next one died, the other two would inherit them. When the last man died, he would donate all of the business holdings and assets to a charitable trust. They did not want all the businesses and assets they had to be passed to their heirs. A small amount would be set aside for heirs each time one of the men died, but the majority of their business holdings would be put into the trust according to the pact. In 1959, Arthur became embroiled in a scandal involving Henry Welch, the chief of antibiotics at the Food and Drug Administration. It began with an investigative reporter named John Lear. He had a friend who was a research physician at a hospital. He showed Lear stacks of advertisements that his hospital received for drugs, and said that many of the ads contained fraudulent information and questionable claims. One particular ad had caught his attention. It was for an antibiotic called Sigma Mycin from Pfizer. Leah decided to investigate. He felt that the ad was intentionally deceptive, and it was produced by Arthur Sackler's firm. In January 1959, Leah published his initial investigation, where he asserted that prescription drugs were vastly overprescribed using questionable science and that pharmaceutical advertising was partly to blame. After the article came out, Leah got a tip that he should look into Henry Welsh at the FDA if he wanted to learn more about business interests corrupting medicine. Leah spoke to sources who told him that Welsh earned significant income from publishing two medical journals with his business partner and fellow regulator, Felix Marty Ibanez who happened to be good friends with Arthur Sackler. Leah then contacted Senator Estes Kafauva, who was chairman of the Antitrust and Monopoly Subcommittee, and was investigating the drug industry. Kafauva had previously gained recognition for a groundbreaking investigation into the Mafia, and he saw similarities in how the drug industry and the Mafia operated, especially in how they bribed and corrupted public officials at all levels of government, surrounded themselves with different fixers, and all seemed to have the same lawyers. He and Leah, in working together, kept seeing the same name over and over. Leah joked that Arthur Sackler was like an octopus, 
with his tentacles everywhere. At the end of 1959, Senator Kofalfa started convening hearings on corruption in the FDA by the drug industry, and that there was pressure to approve drugs that didn't substantiate the claims they made. The president of Pfizer was called to attend and explain why they had marketed a particular drug as having no side effects when their own medical director had found that 27% of people prescribed the drug did have side effects. And then the bombshell. A witness named Gideon Nachumi was called. He used to work as an in-house copywriter for Pfizer. He testified that in 1956, he was given an assignment to revise a speech that Henry Welsh was going to give at a symposium on antibiotics. He added to the speech a passage about an upcoming third era of antibiotics, which was a slogan that Pfizer planned to use when marketing their new drug, Sigma Mycin, which was brought to market with that slogan one month after Welsh gave that speech. Coincidentally, Welch's speech was to be reprinted in one of the medical journals that he owned, and the journal was going to sell special reprints of the speech, for some reason. Like anyone would want that. Well, someone did want it. Pfizer ordered 238,000 copies of these reprints, which were essentially worthless. It was clearly a bribe. Let's not have any panic! The firemen are here! The firemen are here! Let's have no panic! Take it easy! Welch was called to testify, but didn't show up. He said that his doctor told him he was in danger of having a heart attack if he came to testify. Welch's partner, Marty Ibanez, also didn't show up, claiming that he had a serious case of glaucoma and could go blind if he came to testify. But it was over for them. The committee subpoenaed Welch's bank records and found that between 1953 and 1960, he had earned over $287,000 from advertising in his journals, even though he had claimed not to make any money from them. It was unclear how much of that money came from Pfizer, but he ended up resigning from the FDA and somehow escaped any criminal charges. He even got to keep his full pension. Then Arthur's pal Froelich was called to testify as well, but he said that his doctor had diagnosed an eye disorder too, and that might be worsened by his testifying. He then promptly fled to Europe. Finally, Arthur himself was called to testify, after the subcommittee found his name everywhere in their months-long investigation. And get this, almost as if he orchestrated all of this himself, Arthur actually showed up, and he basically talked circles around the subcommittee until the time of the hearing expired. And I wish I could show you some footage of that, but I couldn't find any. Sorry. The senators never got to ask him about the deceptive ad for Sigma Mycin, or really anything else. And really, what were they going to do? Despite all this, Arthur's ad business was still going strong at this point, and he was very, very successful. But soon he would become mega rich from producing the advertising campaign for a new drug from Roche that they developed in the late 50s. The drug, Librium, or Librium, was a new class of tranquilizer that was weaker than other tranquilizers like Thorazine, which is often used to treat disorders like schizophrenia. Roche claimed that the drug could be used to treat a variety of conditions, like depression, anxiety, and alcoholism. By this time, pharmaceutical branding was getting big, and patients were going to their doctors and requesting specific drugs. However, at the time, the FDA had banned advertising pharmaceuticals directly to consumers. Arthur found some creative ways around this problem. In 1960, he worked with a journalist from Life magazine to write an article about a new drug called Librium being used by veterinarians to tranquilize animals. The article asserted that Librium, unlike other tranquilizers, would leave beasts feeling awake and refreshed rather than groggy, and that the drug 
may eventually have important human uses. Librium went on the market one month later, accompanied by all of Arthur's usual advertising tricks, and it became a huge success. After one year of being on the market, doctors were writing one and a half million new prescriptions for Librium every month. But when Librium was introduced, Roche was already working on a new version of the drug that worked in smaller doses. They called it Valium. But Valium and Librium were basically the same thing, so how were they going to market it without cannibalizing their own business? Well, Arthur had an idea. His strategy was basically to market Valium for medical conditions that they didn't market Librium for. For example, they marketed Librium for anxiety, so they would market Valium for psychic tension. They expanded into marketing the drug for novel fields, like sports medicine. Arthur noticed that women were prescribed tranquilizers more often than men, and seized the opportunity to make ads suggesting that Valium would help women in all walks of life. Stressed out college students, housewives, career women, women who were menopausal, not menopausal enough, and so on. He also did ads for tranquilizers made for children, which could help them with things like being afraid of the dark and monsters under the bed. Valium has been prescribed for so many conditions, one observer in a medical journal at the time quipped, when should we not prescribe this drug? Valium, for the response you know, want and trust. In 1964, 22 million prescriptions for Valium were written annually. In 1968, Valium overtook Librium to become the nation's most popular drug, and by 1973, 100 million prescriptions for Valium were written annually. But despite these incredible figures, Roche faced a problem. They had told regulators that Valium had no side effects, and that it wasn't at all addictive. As it turns out, Roche never did any studies on the addictiveness of Valium at all. In fact, they actively buried evidence that it could be addictive, which was discovered later by a consultant that they had hired. The company maintained that if anyone showed signs of withdrawal when stopping the drug, it wasn't because they were addicted, but rather because symptoms of their underlying conditions got worse without the drug, and therefore they in fact needed a higher dose. Over time, stories about people getting addicted to Valium became common, and Roche changed tactics, claiming that the drug itself wasn't addictive, it was just being abused by drug addicts who had addictive personalities. The drugs aren't bad, it's the abusers that are bad. Also, it's not addictive. The exact reasoning was later used by Purdue Pharma, when they tried to claim that OxyContin wasn't addictive. Back in 1965, the federal government began to investigate Valium and wanted to regulate it as a controlled substance. Roche spent almost a decade fighting against the regulation and finally submitted to the FDA in 1973, right before the patent for Valium expired, which would make it worthless to them anyway. Through all of this, Arthur added to his immense wealth by advertising Valium. In the following years, his focus shifted more and more toward philanthropy, and doing what economist Robert Reich, years later, would call reputation laundering. Arthur had begun his philanthropy and art collecting back in the early 1950s, but after his success with marketing Valium, he began to spend more and more time on this endeavour but he seemed to distance himself from his success with Valium. When asked, he would always insist that Valium was a drug that helped people and wasn't addictive. But when he gave speeches about himself at various charitable events, he never mentioned his work in pharmaceutical advertising or Valium, even though that's where all the money for his philanthropy had come from. To me, it feels like he was somewhat embarrassed about where he made his money. Many different family members, co-workers, and acquaintances over the years have said that they feel Arthur's philanthropy 
was mostly about him trying to evade death. That if he left his name in all of these prestigious places for doing good things, he wouldn't be forgotten. He would have his good name, in a sense, as his father said many years prior. As Arthur's longtime lawyer would later say of Arthur's philanthropy, philanthropy isn't charity. With philanthropy, you get something in return. It's a business deal. As time went on, Arthur became increasingly estranged from his two younger brothers. Some family members and acquaintances commented that over the years, maybe Arthur became resentful of his brothers, who seemed to be enjoying the fruits of Arthur's labours when he had been supporting them basically all of their lives. There was one big incident that seemed to solidify this distance between them, and in the end would split the Sackler dynasty into two different factions. Arthur and his children on one side, and Arthur's two brothers and their children on the other. Their old pal Froelich died unexpectedly, and his business holdings were supposed to go to Arthur and his brothers equally, as per the agreement made decades earlier. But Arthur still ran his ad company, McAdams, so he couldn't take ownership in Froelich's ad agency due to conflict of interest rules. So. Arthur wanted to put his own share of Froelich's holdings into the trust that they all agreed to set aside. Mortimer and Raymond argued that because Froelich's business had international offices, they were considered an international business, and thus not subject to the agreement that the men had made. Arthur was deeply crushed by all of this. Froelich's entire company had been secretly financed and, by many accounts, at least partly secretly operated by Arthur, while his brothers had nothing to do with it at all. In the end, Mortimer and Raymond got to keep the holdings, and Froelich's company then went public, netting the two brothers $37 million in profits, which they declined to share with Arthur in any way. After that, Arthur and his brothers effectively stopped speaking. Arthur continued his philanthropy and pretty much separated himself from Mortimer and Raymond's side of the family. Then, in 1987, Arthur had a sudden heart attack and was admitted to hospital. In typical Arthur fashion, he was secretive about it. The only person who knew was his then wife, and he checked into the hospital using a fake name. Who the hell knows why? By the time his children found out and came to the hospital, their father was already dead. His children were set to inherit his business, but ultimately, Raymond and Mortimer and their many children ended up with full control of Purdue Frederick, which would be rebranded as Purdue Pharma in 1991. To this day, Arthur's own children decry where their cousins, Arthur's nieces and nephews, took the company. To use the same tactics Arthur used in creating massive demand for Valium, but not with a tranquilizer, but an opioid, OxyContin. Thanks for watching, see you later.